Last time, we had just begun to ask how the criminal law responds to the case of the defendant, whose use of force and self-defense is based on unreasonable beliefs. The defendant might be unreasonably mistaken about the existence or gravity of a threat. The defendant might be unreasonably mistaken about the necessity to use force to avoid a threat, real or unreal. We would hesitate to say that such a defendant was justified and the traditional doctrine refused to. The issue comes up in the case of State versus Norman. The defendant shot and killed her abusive husband as he slept. She was charged with murder and convicted of voluntary manslaughter. The trial court had denied the jury the opportunity to consider her defense of self-defense. The Intermediate Court of Appeals ordered a new trial for error in denying the self-defense instruction. In that court's view, a jury might find that the defendant reasonably feared an imminent deadly threat and reasonably believed deadly force was her only means of avoiding it. On the state's appeal to the North Carolina Supreme Court, counsel for Norman argued in the alternative. It was error not to give a self-defense instruction and secondly, if that were not an error, it was error to deny the defendant a jury instruction on so-called imperfect self-defense. A table might help sort all this out. Assume a defendant has used deadly force and committed a homicide. Suppose, in addition, that the defendant did not reasonably believe there was a deadly threat or did not reasonably resort to the use of deadly force to avoid that perceived threat. Of course, the defendant might also be unreasonably mistaken in both respects. Traditionally, the defendant would be convictable of murder. It would not matter whether her mistaken beliefs were reckless or merely negligent. Recall that a negligent belief is one that a reasonable person would not form. The asterisk after the word murder acknowledges that in a minority of jurisdictions, a provision is made for one who kills in the sincere but unreasonably mistaken belief that killing was necessary to avoid an imminent deadly threat. The grade of the offense is reduced from murder to manslaughter. This is the most typical meaning of the term imperfect self-defense. It remained unclear whether the minority doctrine of imperfect self-defense is available even to the defendant whose mistakes are not merely negligent but, but reckless. The model penal code drafters thought imperfect self-defense was an improvement upon the harshness of traditional doctrine, but they thought they could go one better by drawing a line between the reckless and the merely negligent actor. The reckless user of deadly defensive force would be convictable of manslaughter, while the merely negligent defendant would be convictable only of the lesser offense of criminally negligent homicide, which the model penal code introduced. In the minority of jurisdictions like North Carolina that adopt the imperfect self-defense doctrine, the following options exist. If the defendant reasonably, even if mistakenly believed force was necessary to avert an imminent deadly threat, then the fact finder should acquit. This is perfect self-defense. On the other hand, if the fact finder concludes that the defendant believed force necessary to avert imminent threat, but unreasonably so, then the fact finder should convict the defendant of manslaughter, such as the doctrine of imperfect self-defense. The expression imperfect self-defense has been applied to other circumstances but this one is most typical. Why wasn't Norman entitled to instruct an instruction under either doctrine? The Norman court wrote, there was a lack of any belief by the defendant, reasonable or otherwise, that she faced a threat of imminent death or great bodily harm from the drunk and sleeping victim. A lack of any belief. The court holds, in other words, that there was no evidence from which a reasonable jury could find that the defendant even believed she faced an imminent threat. Why not? 
The key to the court's reasoning is its understanding of the concept of eminence. The term eminent means immediate danger, such as must be instantly met, such as cannot be guarded against by calling for the assistance of others or the protection of the law. Belief of what might be inevitable at some indefinite point in the future does not equate to what she believes to be eminent. The Norman Court's analysis has been widely criticized. It brushes aside what the jury could reasonably infer from the testimony, including the expert testimony on battered spouse syndrome. This syndrome is manifested in a cycle of violence. The cycle involves three phases. Phase one, tension builds in the relationship between the battered and the batterer. Phase two, the tension explodes in an episode of acute battering, followed by phase three. Completing the cycle, the batterer is contrite, begs for forgiveness, promises to become a better person. But where the syndrome is manifested, phase three is merely the prelude to more argument, more tension, and the cycle repeats. Why does the battered partner endure it? The syndrome exhibits what is called learned helplessness. In Norman, the court wondered why the defendant did not call the police or seek shelter with her relatives. The defendant sincerely believed, and likely truly believed, that her circumstances allowed no escape. Her predicament, as she perceived it, is similar to that presented in The Burning Bed, a TV movie based on an actual incident in which a battered woman set her sleeping batterer aflame as he slept. Necessity? The victim in the film, like the victim in Norman, was not a sympathetic character. He deserved punishment, but for what crime? Capital punishment? Vigilante justice hardly solves the underlying issues. The Norman court emphasizes the lawful alternatives open to the defendant and the helplessness of the victim at the moment of her use of deadly force. Compare Norman and The Burning Bed to another story. You may have read it in high school, The Most Dangerous Game. The suave and wealthy victim invites a couple to dine with him on his private island. Over dinner, he tells them that in the morning, he will release them into the jungle and will hunt them like wild game. His seriousness is on display. He has human heads mounted on the wall. Must the couple wait until their host has opened fire on them? Surely not. At what point, though, do they become privileged to use deadly force in self-defense? When the danger is imminent? Not until morning? The Norman opinion suggests that danger is never imminent so long as there is a chance of calling for the assistance of others or the protection of the law. It seems that the couple in the most dangerous game had lost that chance when they stepped onto the island. Their host has them in his control even as he sleeps. Couldn't a reasonable jury have concluded that Norman had similarly become a prisoner of her batterer, or had sincerely believed she had? The drafters of the Model Penal Code chose a different formulation of the traditional eminence requirement. The use of force upon or toward another person is justifiable when the actor believes that such force is immediately necessary on the present occasion. Immediately necessary on the present occasion. Would Norman have had a better shot at the jury under the model penal code formulation? In any event, battered spouse syndrome evidence is more readily admitted by courts now than when it first began to be offered. Some courts allow expert battered spouse syndrome testimony to show that the defendant believed she faced an imminent deadly threat. Few, however, allow expert battered spouse syndrome testimony to show that the defendant's beliefs were reasonable.